Okay, so, so we're at session four. <clears throat> Father, we come to you. Lord, draw us after you. Draw us after your Son, Father. Draw us by that wooing of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, your awesome beauty and your fiery love for us. We can't even imagine the full story of the gospel in your heart. Lord, that you, the uncreated God, desired us, became a man and died for us, that you could embrace us, you could adorn us and embrace us and enthrone us at your right hand forever and forever and forever. Now draw us after you, O God, through your word. Come and touch our hearts with the kiss of God that awakens us to this bridal paradigm of your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, in these sessions, I, my uh, purpose is to give more notes than I can cover. So we'll go through some parts of it very fast. And the, but the point of it is for you to read it later, not just to say, yeah, I heard that because uh, you can't grasp this at, at just a sitting. This, the goal is to get you to understand the Song of Solomon but for the point of what? Turning it into devotional prayer. For the purpose of what? Your emotional chemistry being changed by the Holy Spirit. The Lord would restore the first commandment to first place in your life. It's not enough to just hear a sermon. It's not enough to study it and grasp the fuller implications. It has to be turned into prayer. This book will not help you very much if, it does, if the language of it does not get into your prayer life with God, your devotional life, because that's the context that your emotional chemistry, your spirit is changed dynamically by the Holy Spirit. Okay, the goal of this session is to provide a general outline and a summary of the entire song. This outline is to help you to sense the big picture of what's happening in the overall storyline of, of the song. I'm going to give you a feel for the eight chapters. Now, obviously, we can't look at any detail, but I want you to leave this session with a sense of what the storyline is, what's the development, the progression is, so that as we're going through it, you kind of know where the end is and where we're going at, and it will cause you to understand the process week by week, I believe, a bit, uh, uh, a little more. Now, each of the sessions, I have 20 sessions in this handout. Each session corresponds with the title of a teaching session. Each, each session here is, corresponds with a teaching session. So just understand that. Okay. The, bride, the divine kiss and the bride's life vision. I always say the twofold life vision. In chapter 1, verse 2, she asks for the kiss. She's asking the Father, in my understanding, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And she goes on to declare what I call the twofold life vision in, chapter, in verse 4. Draw me and let us run after you. She's asking the Lord Jesus now, draw me, draw me into intimacy and let me run after you in ministry. Running is plural. Running speaks of public ministry. Drawing is singular. It's the private heart being wooed into the life of intimacy with the Lord. These first four verses, as we'll look at uh, in our next session, uh, these four verses not only give the theme of the song, it also summarizes her theology. These, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, is a, a very compactly condensed theology of holy passion, phrase by phrase, and we'll be able to look at that in more detail in, in, in our next session, but that won't be uh, till later. But... Uh, I, that's a really uh, tremendous one. But the part I want to draw your attention to here is the fact she makes a twofold life vision. She makes a prayer, draw me and let us run after you. The first four chapters of the book focus upon the bride's inheritance. And again, we'll look at this in a lot more detail. And the second four chapters focuses upon Jesus' inheritance. The first four focus upon the bride's inheritance in Jesus, the last four on Jesus' inheritance in the bride. 
He wants us to understand that as we seek something from Him, He is also seeking something from us. He has an inheritance in us like we have an inheritance in Him. The focus of the book completely shifts right in the middle. Chapter 4, verse 16 to 5, 1. That's the exact middle of the book. The focus shifts, and it's no longer her inheritance that is primary, but it, then it's his. It's just, just it's, it, it's the other uh, uh, focus. First four chapters is her inheritance. The second four chapters is his inheritance. Is the focus. There are eight distinct revelations of Jesus in the psalm, as, as we looked at earlier. And we have them written, the last few sentences here, the tender-hearted shepherd, the affectionate father, the sovereign king, the safe savior, the prophetic bridegroom, the ravished bridegroom. I put those together, count them as one, just as the heavenly bridegroom in his prophetic heart and his ravished heart. The suffering servant, the majestic God, and our God, the consuming fire. Those are the eight faces of the Lord Jesus throughout the song that are progressively developed as her progression as her maturity grows through each, each encounter with the Lord. I state again her twofold life vision. Drawing speaks of in- intimacy. Running speaks of ministry. We'll look at that in more detail uh, and next time we meet. Her journey begins actually in chapter 1, verse 5. One, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 4 is her th- the theme and the summary Her theology and her story, the journey into holy passion actually begins in chapter 1, verse 5. And it begins with spiritual crisis, but with a revelation of divine affection. And this is the true beginning point of everybody that goes on to maturity in this life. Now, we'll all be mature in the age to come. Every believer will. The first revelation of Jesus in the song reveals him as a tender shepherd. At this point... Her journey begins with what I call the paradox of grace. She discovers that she is dark in her heart, but she is lovely to God. Her journey begins with a spiritual crisis of shame and sin. But she receives in the context of this crisis of seeing her, her, uh, her uh, shame, she receives a fresh revelation of the beauty of God in, in the divine, uh, the flow out of the divine affection. She's red hot for God as she begins the journey. She wants the kisses of the Lord. She wants to be drawn. She wants to run. But she soon runs right into a dead end road. She loses the original spiritual focus of her life. She experiences two common things. It's chapter 1 verse 6. Rejection from people and shame from her own sin. The two initial crisis experience, and we'll develop, the, we'll, again, we'll, we'll look at this uh, uh, phrase by phrase as we begin to develop the song. She has a desperate cry to have more of Jesus in verse 7. In the midst of this crisis, she says, Jesus, where do you feed your people? I want you to feed me like you did in the early days before she lost her way uh, in, sh- in, in rejection and shame. She's crying out, I have to have more of you, is what's going on actually in chapter 1, verse 7. Then 1, 8, Jesus reveals himself in a glorious way. He gives her a a very, very tender answer. He basically says in verse 8, he gives her the answer of the way out of her dilemma, but says, you're beautiful, I love you, you're beautiful, I love you. Even though you're in crisis, I want you to know that I see the cry in your spirit, and I love you, and you're beautiful to me, even while you're maturing. And in chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, he reaffirms her sincerity. Very, very important principles that in spiritual crisis, what the Lord wants to communicate to us is the fact that he loves us, we're beautiful, and we're sincere. The very things the enemy wants to root out of our hearts so that we become hopeless and despairing and we run from him instead of to him. This is a very, very important strategy of the Lord which reveals really the the counter strategy of Satan. If God's answer in the crisis is, I love you, you're beautiful, and I know you're sincere, you can know that Satan's is exactly the opposite. You're a hopeless hypocrite, God has lost interest in you, and you have no sincerity of heart. Okay, the understanding of her identity in God's beauty. Oh, this is such, well, I'm not going to say it about every section. Say, oh, this is really a good one, but they, they all are. 
They're all very, very good ones. The second revelation of Jesus in the song reveals him as a king expressing the affectionate heart of the Father. In verse 12, uh, she's, uh, she's pictured as at the table with the king, and her, her spikenard, her fragrance, her perfume is ascending forth out of her. She's in the embrace of the king, and there's many descriptions of the, of the father's heart that are reminiscent of Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. The embrace, the banqueting table, the forgiveness after sh- a scandal and rejection, and she's experiencing the embrace of the father. She experiences the joy then of seeing the king and his desire for her. This is an exhilarating time in her life. The Lord loves her and enjoys her even in her weakness. That's what's going on in chapter 1. She comes to a deep understanding of the cross. She's pictured actually as sitting at the table with the king in the finished work of the cross. She sees her identity in the beauty, in his beauty, in the provision of the cross. Okay, she has a threefold response to the Lord's provision. In verse 12 to 14. And that's a magnificent response we'll look at later. Now she, through all of this romance, and she sees how beautiful he is and how beautiful she is. Remember, this is in context to her original early crisis of rejection and shame. What happens now is E is that she discovers a powerful revelation revelation of her identity in Christ. She says, I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valley. I believe that the rose is the bride. You, you've heard it commonly in different songs that Jesus is the, is the, is the rose of Sharon, but I uh, am convinced that it's only possible, from my understanding of the song, that it's the bride for a number of reasons, which we won't go into now. We'll look at some of them later. But she's standing before the Lord saying, I am the rose. I am the lily. I know now who I am. I'm the fragrant rose that God the Father is cultivating. I'm the prize of all the ages that he's going to present to his son one day. She understands herself as the lily in the valley of the fallen world. The only thing pure in a fallen and lost world is that which is, of which the gift of righteousness has has been working and imparting the likeness of Christ into her spirit. So she comes to a new identity as being the rose and the lily before the Lord. She realizes her unique value and beauty to him in verse 2. She says, like a lily among the thorns, so is my love amongst the daughters. The Lord is saying, you are so unique to me. You are my love amongst all the religions of all the peoples of the earth. You alone are separate and unique and valuable to me, is what he's saying to her. Then she begins to experience deep satisfaction in these newfound spiritual pleasures. Chapter 2, verse 3. She says, I sat down in his shade... With great delight, his fruit was sweet to my taste. She's still sitting before the Lord around the table, under the shade tree, and she goes, she's sitting in the finished work of the cross. She's not standing in her own labors. She's sitting in God's shade with tremendous delight, and everything he feeds her is sweet to her taste. And she goes, I love being loved by God, is really what she's saying. But beloved, this is only chapter 2, verse 3, where he begins to establish the superior pleasures, the beginning and the introduction of them in her life. He's what he's doing. He's wooing her into this life of love sickness that when he begins to challenge her later on in chapter 2 and then again in chapter 5, she is bound to him because she's touched some of the introductory pleasures, the superior pleasures of walking with God. She loves being loved by God and she loves loving God. And again, we'll look at each one of the phrases in detail when we get to that portion of the course. She has a deep satisfaction in these newfound spiritual pleasures. She's enjoying God's presence. Earthly happiness is her goal. That's that's a little thing she doesn't quite understand right now. Jesus is a means and not the end of her life yet. He is the stepping stone to the goal of her earthly happiness. And this is a very a powerful reality in all of our lives. That initially, even in the Lord, even in on-fire Christianity, most of our entire life is focused around our earthly satisfaction, even in the Lord. 
how the Lord will even bless us in this age and in the spirit as well as in the natural. It's the blessing of the Lord in both arenas. But the primary issue, it's what she can receive from the Lord in this age in her, in her earthly experience. Very, very rare is the believer whose life and identity is rooted in the resurrection. But that's where the Lord's bringing His end-time church. That we find our reward and our pleasure rooted in the reality of the resurrection. Very, very foreign to the 20th century Western church. But it won't be when the Lord's finished with us. We're not, we're not in a safe place. We're not in a strong place. Where our primary focus is for earthly happiness even in the Lord. Because there's all kinds of tricks and, and, and traps laid if that's the primary mindset. Because that's not the Lord's goal for you. The Lord's goal is for you to find your primary identity in Him and in the resurrection at the end. Before it's over, that's where He brings this church. That's where he, he brought His apostles. Because that's where our beauty and that's where the fullness of the romance just explodes beyond anything that we can imagine. It's a, very, it's, a, it's, it's a real stone of stumbling for the Western church. But the Lord is going to carry His church over the line, so to speak, over the goal line. He's going to see to it that His church is established in true spiritual reality and revelation. This happiness, the goal of her life is earthly happiness. This happiness is most deeply experienced when God's presence is near to her. Now, she doesn't understand that. She thinks... My goal is just Jesus. And Jesus might whisper, well, really my goal is when I release my presence to you and I make you happy now. That's really what your goal is right now. You just don't know that yet. And I'm going to take some of that away from you and I'm going to uh, cause you to see things in order to cause you to mature, to establish you in, in real spiritual truth that you're not familiar with right now. But right now she's sitting under the shade tree being fed apples and raisins and listening to her favorite vineyard worship tapes and just having the time of her life, it couldn't get any better. And here's the point. A lot of believers, their entire goal of Christianity is to enjoy the presence of the Lord. And though we will carry that our entire life in both ages, this focus of enjoying the Lord is very important. But they end their entire vision of Christianity in chapter 2, verse 3. It doesn't go beyond there. You talk to them, they go, if I could just enjoy His presence, that's it. Well, that's not where it's at because He wants to enjoy you as a mature, bridal partner in the mandate that the Father gave Him to disciple nations. You are His partner that will rule the vast empire forever with Him. There's many, many value changes. You are to be an equally yoked partner before the Father is finished with this. It's more than us enjoying His presence for a short time on the earth. That's good. And that's something the Lord wants to, to use to bless us. But that is not the finality of the gospel in any, in any uh, stretch of the imagination. But again, that's where a lot of people, that's their whole goal. You talk to them, you go, that's the ultimate right there is to enjoy the presence of the Lord. God wants you to enjoy His presence surely as an end in itself in one sense. But He also wants you to enjoy, to enjoy His presence to equip you to enter into bridal partnership. I think it's, it's right to call uh, that uh, how He equips us and in its, an end in itself as well. He does want us to enjoy Him as an end in itself. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's more to it than that is my point. I'm going to kind of say it again because this is kind of an important point that, again, most of the Western church, the fervent Western church kind of stops at chapter 2, verse 3 for the most part. She feels the initial pleasure in and experience the Lord's affection. There's no greater pleasure in the human makeup than when God reveals God's affections to, and His beauty, uh, and His imparted beauty to the human spirit. She loves being loved by God. She doesn't yet possess mature love for Him yet. She loves being loved by Him. She loves feeling His love for her. That's it for her. She goes, wow, I got it made. He's wooing her to a life of, of mature partnership that she doesn't even know about yet. Experiencing the presence of God is wonderful, and again, it is in some ways an end, to its, an end in itself. But there's more to God's plan than us enjoying His presence during our earthly life. It's not the same thing as walking in mature bridal partnership. Every believer, even a very young believer, can enjoy His presence, but that's not at all the same as mature partnership with the Lord. That will obey regardless of feelings and circumstances. Verse 1, he brought me to the banqueting table. He brought me to his banqueting table, his ban over me, his love, sustained me with raisins, refreshed me with apples. I'm lovesick. I love being loved. No, I love it. I love it. I love it. That's where it is. 
And just for the record, I love chapter 2, man. I love... I don't ever want to graduate from chapter 2, the experiences of it, but I want my vision to be bigger than chapter 2, but I always want to experience chapter 2. But I want my vision bigger than that. And that's what I was saying earlier, not that we should, uh, we should try to live some kind of morbid life where we don't uh, intend to enjoy the Lord. That's what I'm saying, but our vision is bigger than merely enjoying the Lord during our earthly life. Okay. She cries out for deeper intimacy. Sustain me. Refresh me. I'm lovesick. Give me more of what I have. Give me more is what she's saying. The Lord now comes to challenge the comfort zone. This is the third revelation of Jesus as he comes to her. The first is the shepherd and the, affection, the second the affectionate father. Third, here he comes as the sovereign king in chapter 2. Verse 8 and 9, the voice of my beloved, he comes leaping on mountains, skipping on hills. He's like a gazelle, like a young stag. He st stands behind our wall, looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. She sees him bounding over hills and mountains. She's kind of looking, she says, you're standing behind the wall, looking in the window. And the Lord says, no, you're the one locked in, not me. And this is a picture, we'll develop uh, the reasons for it, but Jesus is now being revealed as the sovereign king who can leap over mountains effortlessly. Every obstacle, human or demonic, is no obstacle to him. He's pictured as boundlessly, effortlessly, subduing nations. Nothing can stand before him. He's operating under the mandate the Father gave him to disciple the nations. Human and demonic obstacles are as nothing. He effortlessly leaps and bounds over these things. He's coming as a king to her this time. She's used to being fed with grapes and raisins at the table under the shade tree on the bed. <laughs> She's not used to mountains. The Lord says, rise up and come with me. The question, the implied question is, where? He goes, to mountains. Come with me, rise. We're going to leap on mountains and hills together. She says, I don't like heights. <laughs> He's challenging the comfort zone. He's invading her. He's disrupting her right now. And though this is a, it's, a, it's, it's always a fun session to teach, and we all, there's always a little humor in it because we all relate to it, but this is, this is real. But most believers don't really go past chapter 2 in their experience very much. When this comes, they, they just kind of back away and say, I don't know, you know, maybe at another season or something. And the Lord says, no, I'm going to have my end-time church with me on mountains. He's calling her, be out of the comfort zone. Get out of the boat. Walk on the water with me. Peter, get out of the boat. Shulamite, come on the mountains with me. Get, leave the house and go on mountains with me. What happens, uh, many wonderful things happen in this passage, but verse 17, she refuses him, her painful compromise. She turns him away, and she says, no, you go leap on the hills without me. Now, this, this crisis is different than chapter 1. Chapter 1 was a, a crisis of rejection by people and, and a legitimate sin, uh, I mean, uh, uh, blatant sin. This is the the uh, compromise rooted in fear. It's not rooted in rebellion at all. These are the little foxes of verse 15. They're the little areas that keep her from mature partnership with the Lord. These are areas, again, that many people never ever face or never embrace in their life. They never, they never look at these in a way that changes the way they spend time and money. These compromises are due to immaturity, fear, and weakness. It's not due to rebellion. She's afraid. Her fear is that 100% obedience might cause her to lose something. The Lord calls some people to a fasted lifestyle. He calls other people to realms of obedience. And, and there's this unspoken fear. It paralyzes us, the fear of losing comfort in the earth. It's, it, and I, I want to say this. I really believe this. And I don't say this mostly from experience. I don't present myself in, in that way. But I believe the fear of going without some things is actually far more powerful than the, than the discomfort of going without them. The fear paralyzes us more than the experience itself. The arena of fasting, people are so afraid of going without them, they're afraid of, 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 of missing out on legitimate 
earthly pleasures in the Western world that I can't even fathom a lifestyle where I don't do what all my friends do that are Christians. And they touch it a little bit and they go, it's not that terrible. Actually, it's kind of, I can touch the Lord in, in a way that I didn't know how to touch Him before. But anyway, she says, no, I can't go in the mountains. I can't rise up. I can't leave the comfort zone. Go without me, is what he tells her. She has this fear that, she has this fear that a hundredfold obedience, a hundred percent obedience is actually, will cause pain and hurt she will lose. And that's a very powerful, unspoken fear that paralyzes the church. The fear of a hundredfold obedience. We think that the God that gave himself is somehow going to hurt us our life in Him by obeying Him. And, and we don't really think it through in a real in detailed way, but it's just this kind of general fear, and we just stay in the comfort zone. Divine chastisement. What happens in verse 1? She says, I sought Him, but I couldn't find Him. But she says, I sought Him on my bed in verse 1. Well, she's not supposed to be on her bed. She's supposed to be on the mountains with the Lord, but she's still on the bed. But I couldn't find Him. In this section, she experiences divine chastisement. But this comes out of the affection of a loving father. The father promises to pry our fingers off of things that hold us in bondage. The father loves us too much to allow his immature church to come up short of being the bride. Our destiny is to go with him on mountains and to conquer the lions and the lepers of chapter 4 that are on the mountaintops, which speaks of spiritual warfare. He's not angry with her. The tender heart of the Father needs to chastise her, but it's, it's a correction. It's not the same thing as rejection. Correction is often confused as rejection. But God's correction is the opposite of rejection. He corrects out of desire. It's exactly the opposite. He corrects out of desire for us. He hides His face from her. It's a brand new experience. The sweetness of chapter 2 is gone. She says, I can't find him anymore. What happened? She goes, what happened to the sweetness and the delight and the shade tree? It's gone. But what the Lord has done is that after we've touched the sweetness of God's presence, then we are forever discontent to live without it. And that's what the Lord was doing. We'll develop that passage. It's a very famous passage in Jeremiah chapter 20 where Jeremiah says, the Lord has deceived me. He said, the Lord in my, in my youth, the Lord wooed me to him, and I was so exhilarated with him, I said yes to him, and I became connected to him where I could never live without him. Then he told me to do a difficult assignment, and I did it. I got in trouble. They threw him in prison, and then in prison, he says, I'm going to quit the difficult assignment, and then the Lord lifted his presence, and he goes, I can't stand it. Uh, you've hooked me to you. I love you. He says, you tricked me. You tricked me. You set me up that I can't take life without your presence anymore and the difficult assignment comes he lifts his presence from her when she compromises not in anger it's the uh, again it's a very very common paradigm of the lord that he's angry and he's breaking us in a ruthless way no he's saying i hooked you up on the front and on purpose for such an hour as this that i could pry your fingers loose from the comfort zone because your destiny and your full exhilaration and my inheritance in you is on mountains with me come you'll rule the whole universe with me come with me now be my mature partner so the Lord lifts his presence because she goes, ouch, ouch, ouch. He goes, I knew it would work. I knew that you loved me. Now rise up and come. That's a magnificent passage as well. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Chapter 3, verse 2, she finally agrees to arise. She goes, okay. Chapter 3, verse I will arise. I will go. I will go. I will go. I will leave the bed and the wall and, and the tree. I will go. Jesus says, that's good, but she goes to the city. He wants her on the mountain. He wants her in the place of the... He wants her to say yes, to trust him in the difficult assignment is the point. It's an issue of trust or an issue of fear. That's what's going on here. Okay. Fresh revelation of Jesus as a safe Savior. The fourth revelation. He reveals himself as safe. It's in chapter 3, verse 6 to 11, where he basically tells her 100% obedience is the only safe place in life. Being with me on the water is far safer than being in the boat without me. You can stay in the boat, but if I'm not in the boat, the boat is in trouble. You're far safer with me on mountains than you are laying in a bed without me. 
And he says, I will protect you. That doesn't mean she won't have difficulty. What he means is, I will cause you to mature in love for which you will understand the wisdom of that focus of God's training in our life. See, sometimes our intentions are we have all these five or ten spheres of how we want God to bless us, and he wants, us to bless, he wants to bless us primarily by developing this voluntary love in our spirit, because on the last day, we understand the currency of eternity is voluntary love. It's not how big a ministry was on the earth. And when the great exchange comes and all of our earthly labors are turned in and God pays us so exorbitantly for our small acts of obedience, we find out in that day the only thing that lasts is that which flowed out of voluntary love. Then we go, thank you that when we were pouting and quitting, you didn't let us quit. He goes, I know you would feel that way today, so I kind of tugged on you and roughed you up a little bit. But uh, uh, you rose up and, and here you are. You're with me and you have a life of obedience to present to me, to me now from your brief stay on the earth. So when I say safety, I don't mean that you will never get a bruise. That's not what I'm talking about because martyrdom has filled the church through history. I'm talking about you will end up in mature love. You will end up with an exhilarated heart. You'll end up with a heart that's not quenched and a heart that's not drowned, a heart fully alive, just filled with the power of God. That's what I mean by you're safe. Because though your body and your finances can be safe, if your heart is quenched and drowned, then you're not safe. I'm saying you will be exhilarated in the pleasure of God and you will agree with wherever God has you. That's the safe place when you have the power to walk in love and agreement with Him with no complaint. That is safety if the Lord can bring you there. Paul the Apostle said, I'm content in whatever state I find myself in. That's a safe place in the Spirit. He goes, high or low, sink or swim, hot or cold, I'm happy in God because I've touched a certain reality in God. That is the safety that I'm talking about the Lord promises His people. Paul died a martyr. Jesus tells him in, in Luke chapter 21, he says, let me tell you, he says, and Matthew 10, put them together, he says, uh, don't worry. He says, they can't harm you. They can't harm you. Though they kill you, that's the next verse. He says, you won't lose one hair of your head. He's talking about the resurrection. He says, forever and forever, not one hair of your head will be, hurt, will, will be lost. Though they kill you, they cannot harm you. You have no reason to fear them. They cannot hurt you. They can kill you. But every hair of your head will be restored to you forever and forever and forever. So don't be afraid is what he tells them. You're safe if you stay connected to me. That's the safety we're talking about. Again, in, uh, and I'm not trying to be negative, I'm just trying to be honest. In the Western world, our safety is basically defined in very different ways than the Lord's is. The Lord has safety in natural things. But that's not the primary safety. The safety is a heart enthralled, a heart exhilarated in God. Because that's where the church has lost its way. If we have that, we have the gold that lasts forever and forever. He reveals himself as a safe savior. It's two different picture, uh, uh, pictures of chapter 4 of the heavenly bridegroom. First, he's showing himself in the prophetic heart of the heavenly bridegroom. He's equipping her for warfare. And then it's the ravished heart of the heavenly bridegroom. He's equipping her to embrace the cross. It's the fifth revelation of Jesus, the heavenly bridegroom. Two different aspects of it. He looks at her as she has this newfound revelation of her safety in the Lord. And he says in chapter 4, verse 1, you are beautiful, you are beautiful. And then he goes on and he lists prophetically eight different budding virtues in her life. And we'll look at the meaning of each one of them. He begins to speak to her according to the cry of her spirit. He's speaking to her things that she longs for that she has not yet fully walked in. I love this part of the Lord. The Lord looks at Gideon. The Midianites in Judges 6 are about to destroy Israel. Gideon is hiding. The angel appears and says, Gideon, mighty man of valor. He's hiding. He's scared to death. He's naming him. He's calling him forth. He's establishing the truth of who God's made him. And Gideon kind of shakes off his fear and goes, like, who me? He goes, God has named you mighty man of valor. He looks at Peter, who's going to deny the Lord three times before a servant girl on two occasions. And he says, you're the rock. You're the unmovable one, Peter. You are the rock, and that's what God the Father has named you. And he walked in that stability in the days that would follow. At first, he would waver. And the Lord is prophetically calling her forth. He's looking at the budding virtues. He's looking at the cry in her spirit. And here's the glorious uh, truth here. God defines you by the cry in your spirit, not through your attainment of maturity. 
He doesn't look at you and say, your life is perfectly mature, therefore you're really lovely. He looks at the cries of your spirit and says, look at that. Look at what you want. I know what you want. All you have to do is want it, and in time it will be real because I will answer your cry because I will not violate your free will. The Lord works that we would set our intention on certain things. And once our heart is set, and He doesn't violate this voluntary love dynamic, the Lord calls us beautiful when we set the thing in our hearts. I say, Lord, I want the kisses of your mouth. I, I don't walk in them in any way the way I want to, but I want them, and the Lord looks at that, and He defines me as a lover of God because of the cry of my heart, and the same with you. Look what happens in chapter 4 now. Verses 1 to 5, he, he calls out eight budding virtues. Verse 6, one of the, one, chapter 4 is the turning place, but verse 6 is really beginning to pick up. She says, okay, okay, I will go my way to the mountain. I'll go to the mountain. Something dynamic has happened. She says, I will go, say yes to the very issue that I said no to in chapter 2. I will go to the mountain. That's what's going on here. Now look what's on the mountains. Verse 8, the lion's dens, the mountains of lepers, devouring beasts of the wild, devouring animals of prey are up there. It speaks of spiritual warfare. The Lord wants us with Him, ruling and reigning and combating against the powers of darkness. He wants a church. He wants a, he, he wants a bridal partner. Verse 8 is the first time in the whole song He calls her my bride. It's the first time He calls her that. Verse 9, now he, call, he declares one of the great passages, you've ravished my heart. He goes, my heart is undone, because she said yes in verse 6. I'm undone, my, my heart is struck with the unusual beauty of who you are. That's what's going on. Verse 12, one of the great descriptions, he calls her an enclosed garden. He says, your, your heart is a locked garden, because a garden in the ancient world, a garden of a king... Uh, could not a lot it was locked so it would not be polluted by all the the beast and all the travelers because everybody would go to the well or a or or a, a place where there was water and it was just all soiled and disease ridden but a king's garden was locked and completely undefiled he says you're a locked garden you've reserved yourself totally to me because I know who you are and she's only really said yes up to this point in time she hasn't even endured the great test yet she said yes in her spirit and the Lord has moved. And he goes on to describe in such a beautiful way through the rest of chapter 4 the beauty of the bride who's in a posture of saying yes. Four sixteen is the real key. She prays in verse 16, Awake, O north wind, come, O south wind, blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out, that my beloved may come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. That's the turning point of the whole book right there. Every phrase is so filled with meaning. She cries out to the God that she was afraid to obey. She says, send the north winds, as, the, as well as the south. The north winds were the bitter winds, the cold winds of the north. She says, send the north winds, as well as the south winds. She goes, blow upon my garden, difficulty and blessing. I trust you with the combination because I want my spice. I want the fragrance of God to emanate out of my heart. Now here's the key phrase, let my beloved come to his garden. The first four chapters, every time the garden is mentioned, it's hers. In this very verse, it's her garden on, the, on, on uh, the third phrase. And on the fifth phrase, she says, it's your garden. For now on, she's dealing with her life in the, in, and through the lens of being his inheritance. She goes, I'm not in this thing for me. I'm in it for you now. I'm in it for you. I am now your garden. I define my life very differently than I did before. I don't care what happens to me on the earth. I am yours and only yours. And I want you to come and eat the fruits out of my life that please your heart, O oh God, that bring joy to you, that satisfy the Father's plan for me to be your inheritance. That's what's going on. She's not afraid anymore. She says, send the north winds or send the south winds. It doesn't matter. Beloved, when we get to a place where we've seen the safe Savior and His ravished heart and He loves us, we've committed to go to the mountain 
And we have, we have no fear. We say, send whatever you send in the will of God. The north or the south winds. Now, I'm not saying that we should lay down and let the devil have free access into our life. There's a place to stand and use the name of Jesus to say no and to shut the door of the enemy. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about the difficult assignments of the Lord, the north winds. The bitter winds of the north. She stands before the Lord. She says, I'm not afraid of you. I really am not afraid. Send what you might send. I am your bondservant. I want my garden to be yours. I want it to be filled with spice. I want you to have pleasant fruits. Uh, I want you to have pleasing fruit from my life. Now look at chapter 5. Nine times the Lord takes ownership. You're my garden. You're my bride. You're my, I've gathered my myrrh, my spice, my honeycomb, my honey, my wine. Nine times he says about her life, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. The whole thing changes right now. The focus of the book is entirely different than the next four chapters. Okay. The ultimate twofold test of maturity. Now it's going to really pick up. She said, I'm not afraid of you. Send the north or the, and the south, both and. We don't want to get a, 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 some kind of masochistic view of the kingdom of God and say only, you know, some people say send only the north winds. No, we want the north and the south. We want both and that the garden would come forth in spice, don't we? So the Lord, it's, it's like he's saying to her, you really want the spice of God in your life. You want the full fragrance. You want to really belong to me, don't you? Because yes, he goes, well, there's another face you haven't seen yet. In chapter 5, verse 2 to 7, he's going to show her the face of Jesus of Gethsemane, the sufferings of Christ. He's going to stand before her in chapter 5, verse 2, with his hair drenched and covered in the dew of the night. It pictures Jesus alone through the night in the garden of Gethsemane is, is the imagery. The, some of the medieval teachers called it the dark night of the soul. The place where things don't seem as though they should. The Lord stands before her with an entirely new face as the suffering servant in verse 2 with his hair covered with the drops of the night. He's been through the dark night alone under the dampness of the night. And he's standing before her as the one that's endured the sufferings, the suffering servant. And he goes, you love me as a shepherd. You love me as a father, as, a, as, a, as, as manifesting the tender, the affectionate father. You love me as a safe savior, as a bridegroom, but will you say yes to me as a suffering servant? Will you enter into my sufferings? Colossians 1, 24. Paul said, I want to fill up my part of the sufferings of Christ. I want to enter into that intimacy with the Lord that very few ever enter into. That's what's going on here. And so verse 6 and 7, I call it the ultimate twofold test. She responds in so obedience. Verse 6, the presence of God lifts from her. Verse 7, the watchmen of the city, the leaders, the authorities, they strike her, they wound her, and they take their veil, her covering off of her. So verse 6, God's presence lifts from her. And verse 7, the leaders, her spiritual covering, kick her out, and she has no ministry now. The two things that she cried for throughout the whole book, draw me into, that's intimacy, draw me after you and let us run, draw me into intimacy, verse 6, the intimacy has been suspended. Verse 7, I want to run after you, she has no function in the body, the anointing has been lifted for ministry, she has no place to function. Here she is, without feeling the presence of God, verse 6, and without any favor or place to function in the body. To, uh, to operate in the way God's called her to operate in verse 7. The Lord's looking at her and he's in essence saying, he goes, are you still mine? Are you in it for me? Are you still in it for you? And the answer she gives at the end, of, throughout this uh, thing, she goes, I'm in it for you, O oh God. I told you north or south winds, it doesn't matter. I want to enter into intimacy with you. I want, I want to be an equally yoked bride in full partnership. I want to enter into the sufferings of Christ alongside you. One of the great passages, she says in verse 8, she goes to the daughters of Jerusalem that are far less mature than she is. And she goes, I want to tell you that if you find him, if you find him... My beloved, she names him. She goes, tell him, I'm not angry at him at all. I'm lovesick. I am in it for him till the end. I love him. If you find him, tell him, I'm lovesick for him. 
And the Lord's watching her. He's not answering her. This, this, in chapter 3, the Lord lifted his presence to chastise her, to get her to obey. In chapter 5, it's very different. He lifts his presence to cause a deep reality of the intimacy in the sufferings of Christ to be established. And the Lord looks at her and he says, like he said to Abraham, he says, now I know you fear me without any exception. I, you belong to me. There is nothing that can buy you. Nothing can pull you off the track. And now these daughters are a little bit troubled by her. In verse 9, they go, we got a question. Why is it you love him so much? His presence is lifted from you, verse 6. He lets the people wound you, verse 7. You're, you have no ministry, no anointing for service. You're left just free-falling. You're just pure, raw, nothing. There you are. Why do you like him? And that's the voice the body of Christ will say to God's servants when they're in this season. She says, verse 10 to 16, I call it the greatest statement of worship in the whole Word of God from my point of view. It's 10 different statements. She goes, I'll tell you why I love him so much. Verse 10, he's brilliant. He's ruddy, dazzling, it says in, 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 uh, in the New American Standard. He's radiant, it says in the NIV. Or he's brilliant. He's chief among 10,000. His head, his hair, his eyes, his cheeks, his lips, his hands. His body, his legs, she goes right on and talks about ten aspects of the beauty of the Lord. Jesus is appearing in his majestic splendor and beauty. And in verse 6 she said, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. I am in it forever for good. There's nothing can turn me. I love him. This is who he is. She's speaking with such depth of revelation and feeling in the midst of such suffering and such testing. The Lord is, is remaining silent. He hasn't spoken to her. People are speaking to her, but the Lord is staying at a distance watching her. She's done nothing wrong, but agreed to go to the mountain and to accept the north winds and the south winds, that the Lord's, her garden would become the Lord's garden. Chapter 6, verse 1, they change the question. They, they don't say, why do you want to love him? She goes, where is he? We want to seek him with you. If he's really that way, we're going to be converted to your standard, not bring you down to ours. The Lord told Jeremiah, he says, as for you, you can't go to their standard. They can come to yours, but you better not go to their standard. That's what he told Jeremiah, a very significant passage. That's what's happening here in chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 4, the Lord breaks the silence in one of the great passages of the divine romance anywhere in the scripture. The Lord now breaks the silence. She hasn't felt his presence. She's been mistreated in the body. She's been falsely accused. The Lord wanted to know where her identity was. Was her identity in her ministry? Was her identity in the things she felt and experienced? Or was her identity in the fact of what God said about her and who she was to God? And she came through brilliantly. In chapter 6, verse 4, he says, You are as beautiful as Tirzah. You are as lovely as... As Jerusalem, you are as awesome as an army with banners. And an army was, uh, with banners was an army that returned from the battle victorious. You are victorious over the passions of your own heart. You've stood the great twofold test. You stand before me now as a victorious army. He says, you're lovely. You're beautiful. You can't even see me, but you stay true to me. He goes, look at this. And he declares this. And in verse 5, one of the great romantic passages, he says in Romantic imagery, he goes, turn your eyes away from me. You've conquered my heart. Here he is, God, looking at the bride who stood true in testing. He goes, my heart can't be conquered by all the armies of the earth, all the powers of darkness, but a believing, a believing, steadfast, loving believer on the earth conquers my heart. He goes, look at you. You think I'm lovely and I've allowed you to enter into the sufferings of Gethsemane alongside of me. And I'm not talking about adding to the atonement. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the many, many dimensions of which God might call individuals to any, the many, many dimensions of the suffering Christ. And he calls you to several of them in your life. What he calls you to, he probably won't call the other person to. They're very unique and tailor-made. He goes on and expresses his adoration and devotion over her. Chapter four, verse, chapter 6, verse 4 to 10 is absolutely fantastic where the Lord is telling her who she is in her place of steadfastness. Trouble has started now. She's walking in this revelation of who she is before the Lord. There's persecution and she's vindicated. 
Okay. She enters into mature partnership now with the Lord. She's passed the test, and now she's actually walking out mature partnership in, in actuality in everyday life. Okay. He invites her to receive the seal of fire upon her heart, that consuming the God as a consuming fire stands before her and says, I want to put my fire into you, the supernatural love that seals you, that will assure that your heart, verse 7, your love will never be quenched, and your heart will never be drowned, and it will never be quenched. I, I want to assure you that you will live on forever and ever in the overflow of supernatural love. The bride's final intercession and revelation of herself, actually, of who she is before the Lord. We'll go to chapter 8, verse 13 and 14. It's her final statement. I just love this. The Lord speaks to her one last time in verse 13. He goes, you who dwell in the gardens, he says, in the gardens in the midst of the body, ministering and touching the others. He goes, the companions, the multitudes are listening for your voice. She said, look at you. Many of the young ones, you're feeding them. They, they, they hang on every word from your mouth. They're listening intently to everything you say. Your ministry is prospering, and, and you're impacting people in a deep way. But he tells her one last time, he says, in this great overflow of all the people listening, let me hear your voice as well. Don't get so busy that you forget who you are. You're my bride first, and you're a, a discipler of people second. You're my bride. Let me hear it too. And then she cries out, and she says the great prayer, the romance prayer, the Maranatha prayer you find in the book of Revelation. She says, well, make haste, my beloved. Come to me. Come to me like that gazelle and that stag. Remember from chapter 2, verse 8, he was the gazelle and the stag on the mountains. She says, you've conquered all of history. You've conquered all the realm of the Spirit. Oh, conquering stag on the mountain of God, come to me. And he says to me, come from the mountain of spices. And she's here describing the eternal city through this imagery, of, uh, which is reality, of all the vast spices and fragrances and beauty. She says, oh, come, my beloved, from the city of fragrances, oh, conquering stag that's conquered all the mountains that can be conquered, and come to me then. If you want to hear my voice, take me to yourself. Maranatha, come quickly, is what she cries. She ends the journey fully in love, romanced and true at the very end, looking for the return of the Lord. Amen and amen. Let's stand. I realize if this song is new to you, you're kind of, your head's maybe spinning a little bit. But in a little while, this song won't be new to you. In a little while, this song will become familiar, yet ever new. The song, even tonight, just rereading it, just, it's just so many new ideas were coming to my spirit. It's familiar, yet ever new. It's ever fresh. That's the power of the song. It is eternally fresh. Father, we come before you. Lord, we say that we do love you. Oh, Lord, would you woo us? God, to your table to sit under the shade tree and to enjoy you, we say yes. Oh, God, would you call us lovely when we've encountered rejection and our own sin in chapter 1. You call us lovely. We're dark but lovely. God, we say that we are lovely before you, and that's where some of you need to respond tonight. You are lovely to the Lord right now. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.